Good day and welcome from London to the Sightline Pharma R&D Review 2016 webinar. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today for what we hope will be an interesting and informative presentation. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how to participate in today's webinar. First, you should have a control panel on the right hand of your screen. Towards the bottom of the control panel is the Q&A pane. You may submit questions or comments in writing using the Q&A pane during the presentation. All answers to your questions will be answered after the webinar by email. Today's webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive an email with a link to view and listen to a recording of today's event. My name is Ian Lloyd and I'm Senior Director for Pharma Projects and Data Integration and Sightline and I'm one of the presenters today. I'm also the author of Sightline's Pharma R&D Report and its new active substance supplement which this presentation is based on. I'm now going to ask my co-presenter Alex Shimmings to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Alex Shimmings. I'm the Managing Editor of Script Intelligence and I've worked with Ian for many years in devising this report. Thanks Alex. So let's get started. So here's our agenda for the day. First of all, we're going to look at kind of the headline figure, if you like, the number of active drugs in the pipeline as of the start of this year, which we'll be then comparing across similar numbers from previous years. This is kind of like the headline figure. Is the pipeline expanding or contracting? Then we'll pause and move away from the current pipeline to take some time to review the success stories of 2015, the new active substances which were launched during that year, and Alex will give an overview of the numbers, the most successful companies, the markets where most launches took place, and look at some of the standout products, some of the, the drugs which are innovative or novel in, a, in some way. Then we'll come back to the pipeline and start slicing and dicing it in a number of different ways. And I'll be looking at the pipeline by development phase to start with to discern any trends there. Then we'll be looking at the companies involved, the top 25 R&D players, and how the rankings have changed since the same time last year. And we'll take a review of the top indications, mechanisms and targets as well to get a real flavour of what's happening in R&D. And finally, we'll wrap up with a quick outlook on what to look out for in 2016, including a look out for which uh, of the interesting new drugs which are heading towards approval. So let's do the big reveal and give you the headline figure. So this graph shows you the number of drugs in the pipeline uh, in January each year, going back from 2001 to the current year 2016. And I should start off by saying, by pipeline, we're talking about all drugs in development by companies, right from uh, preclinical, when they're first reported to be in development, through the three phases of clinical development, through the registrational phases. And the figure does include some launch drugs as well, but they have to still be in development for further markets or for further indications. So what you can see here is uh, 13,718 drugs in the pipeline as of January 2016 when this data was first compiled for the aforementioned report. Uh, and this is up from 12,300, a significant increase from last year, 11.5%. And in fact, it's actually been increasing even more since then. As of April the 1st, it was up to 14,435. So let's look at the key facts for the pipeline. As we mentioned, the number of active drugs is now over 13,700. The 11.5% 11 increase uh, best the increase we saw from the previous year, which is 8.8%. And it maintains a trend of ever increasing rises. If you look at the, the graph there, you can see uh, compared to 2001, the pipeline is approaching three times as big as it was only 15 years ago, which is pretty significant, I think. And you can also see that during the early part of the noughties, we saw some gradual increases. And there's a bit of a jump and a bit of a plateau, but really in the last few years it's really been taking off. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. Um, there were 3,442 new drugs added to the Farm Projects database during 2015. This compares to 3,138 new drugs during 2014. So this, this change doesn't actually account for the entire increase we've seen. So what we're actually seeing here is fewer drugs moving out of the pipeline as well as more drugs and entering it. Uh, and this is uh, due to a couple of things. So uh, fewer discontinuations reported in the industry, but also on the editorial side, we've been a little more generous in uh, keeping drugs in early 
development stages in the pipeline before we decide to move them out because of lack of evidence of continuing development. So there is some contribution to this increase from changes in editorial practices, uh, but it's not really significant. Um, the, the large, the greater part of this expansion is due to genuine increases in the number of drugs in the pipeline. So the question is, obviously, uh, pipeline uh, involves spend, um, and uh, so this really, is, it looks like a good thing, but isn't necessarily. It really means that drug companies just are just spending more and more. Uh, and unless they're producing new drugs in, onto the market, it's questionable whether this increase is sustainable, which leads us on into the, the review of the success stories of 2015, which Alex will cover. Thanks, Ian. So in this section, we're going to look at how many novel drugs were launched last year, which companies launched the most drugs, and which were the most popular therapy areas and markets. Then we're going to take an in-depth look at those NASs launched in 2015 that have mechanisms of actions that we've not seen before in drug development, plus a few other of the more interesting drugs that have reached the market in the same year. Now, as you can see, this chart shows the number of new active substance launches by year since 2000. And just to be clear, by new active substances, we're excluding all new formulations or combinations. These are novel drugs that have reached the market for the first time. And as you can see on the right, there were 46 new active substance launches in 2015, and that was a sharp fall from the year before. But what this chart's also making clear is that 2015 wasn't a bad year by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, it was one of the best on record. And if we go back into the 1990s, generally we saw new active substance launches tallies in, in the 40s. But then in the early part of this century, there's a pronounced dip. But this has been followed in recent years by much stronger performances. But 2014 was an unusual year. There were several reasons for this that we could think of. But the, the most striking was the glut of hepatitis C products that reached the market in 2014. There was a revolution in the way that disease was treated, and no fewer than seven new active substances directed against the hepatitis C virus were launched that year. Also, which helped the, the 2014 tally is that we had a large number of Japanese launches. Um, in Japan, there have been some regulatory changes as that market tried to reduce its drug lag, and these seem to be bearing fruit. And we'll see a bit more about that later. So another positive takeaway for, for, from 2015 was, was that 14, or just less than a third of the 46 NASs launched, were first-in-class products. This was up numerically and proportionally on 2014. In 2014, although there were 62 NASs, only 12 of those were first-in-class, which was about 19%. What was also striking was that more than half of the NASs were products with orphan status, and 39% were biologicals. And again, we're going to take a close look at that later. Now, this table shows the number of NAS launches last year by company. And also, on the right-hand side, the column gives the relative size of each company's R&D pipeline to give a bit of context. As you can see, Novartis, which has the second biggest pipeline, and Allegan top the list for new active substance launches with four each. Merck and Co, Takeda and Amgen all tied for second place with three launches each and then two and one for the rest of the top ten. So this was the second year running that Novartis held on to the top spot, though last year it shared the top billing with Merck and Co. And as you can see, the list is dominated by big pharma companies, but there is one interloper, Alexion, and its pipeline is nowhere near the top 25, but it still managed to launch two products, which was the same as AstraZeneca. We'll take a look at those a bit later as well. Now, this pie chart looks at the number of NAS launches by therapy area. As you can see, the light blue on the left-hand side of the pie chart, this represents cancer drugs, and this dominates the circle. And this providing solid evidence that there is a revolution in R&D in cancer that is actually bearing some fruit. Second was the anti-infective and metabolic products, and they had eight launches each. This was slightly down on last year's tally for anti-infectives um, because, um, because of the hepatitis C drugs, but this year cancer has clearly overtaken it. 
And what's interesting is that if you look back to, to 2000, you can see a clear upward trend in the launches of anti-cancer drugs. In 2014, these cancer drugs accounted for 29.3% of the pipeline, and but 15% um, of the NAS launches. But last year, these figures had grown. There was 30.4% of the pipeline were for oncology drugs and 28% of the NAS launches. So that's a substantial growth there. Now this slide shows that there is one thing that's not changed and that's the US's dominance as the preferred market for first launch and it had well over half of the NAS launches or 63% which was up from the 56% that we saw in 2014. Coming in second was Japan. This year it beat the whole of Europe combined giving evidence again as we said that the recent push to speed up the drugs approvals process is actually working. It's going to be interesting to see whether it maintains this in the coming years or whether this is just a bulge that we're seeing because of the, the changes that they've made there. In Europe, Germany maintained its spot as the most popular market for first drug launches. It had three, and that's despite the growing pricing and reimbursement difficulties that some companies are experiencing in that market. And now we're going to turn, take a closer look at the first and class products and picking up on the theme of novelty in oncology, we can see that five of the 14 first-in-class NAS, NAS launches were for cancer. So the first two on this list, that's Abvi and Bristol Myers Squibb Simplicity and Gemmab and Johnson and Johnson's Garzelex, offer the increasingly well-served indication of multiple myeloma. Abvi and BMS's Simplicity is actually the first SLAMF7 antagonist to reach the market. This stands for signaling lymphocyte activation molecule family number seven, and it's actually a protein that's highly expressed on multiple myeloma cells, as well as on cells in the immune system, including natural killer cells. What this means is that the product effectively has two-pronged action. It can directly target multiple myeloma cells, as well as activating the immune system. Darzalex, by contrast, is a monoclonal against CD38. This product just pipped its rival to the US market, but both actually received accelerated reviews in the US and in the EU. But what's interesting is that Implicity's label at the moment is a little bit better. It allows its use earlier in the treatment paradigm at second line, which should give it a competitive advantage in the short term at least. Moving on to United Therapeutics Unitoxin, this is for a rare childhood tumour and, and as a result of its approval. And the company received one of the coveted paediatric disease priority review vouchers, which is only the second one to be um, awarded by the FDA. Luckily for it, a few months later, it sold the voucher to Abvi for a cool $350 million. And that was loads more than Biomarin got for its first voucher, the first voucher which it sold to Sanofi and Regeneron last year for $67.5 million. So that's quite an increase over the years. Well, over the year. Now, the final two first-in-class anti-cancers were both small molecule multi-targeted inhibitors that hit new kinases. So we have eye-sized lenvima for metastatic thyroid cancer, which is thought to be the first TKI to hit simultaneously both the fibroblast growth factor receptors 2 and 4, as well as VEGF receptors 1 to 3, among others. Pfizer and Abgen's Ibrance, this one selectively inhibits cyclin-dependent kinases 4 and 6 to regain cell cycle control and block the tumour proliferation. It was approved two months ahead of schedule for first-line use in metastatic disease after the FDA decided it didn't even need to have an ODAC committee meeting. The product has also shown some great um, new data in the new breast cancer population. and um, A big study was stopped early after it hit the primary endpoint early which means that it should have a nice big market to come in the future. And also, an honourable mention, it's not strictly a new mechanism of action, but um, antigens in Ligic deserves a mention because it's the first oncolytic virus therapy for recurrent melanoma. The product is actually a genetically modified herpes simplex virus. It gets injected into the tumour where it replicates to produce granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. What this does is it results in cell lysis and it releases um, lots of tumour-derived antigens for the um, immune system, as well as producing local GMCSF to promote the immune response to the therapy. So moving on to other therapeutic areas, 2015 was a really good year for cardiovasculars. 
in the news this year was dominated by the two hypolipemics, the PCSK9 inhibitors, that's Regeneron and Sinopis proluent, and Amgen's Repatha. Now, these two had a real race to market, but Repatha just beat its rival, thanks largely to the priority review voucher that um, the two companies bought from Biomarin. And now the rivalry between them, this has moved from the regulators to the payers, and the two products are battling it out of the US health insurance system as well as in the courts, and Amgen recently won a patent lawsuit there. But despite all the drama, what's happened is that sales of the products have been slow so far, and this is a, a recurring theme with the products for this year. Moving on to um, Boehringer Ingelheim's Paxbound now. This is interesting. Again, it's not strictly new, but it is interesting as it's the first specific reversal agent for the new oral anticoagulant products, in this case, Boehringer Ingelheim's Prodaxa, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor. So the arrival of Praxbine is expect, what is expected to do is make doctors more comfortable with using Prodaxa, since they know that they'll be able to quickly reverse the effects of the drug if they need to, say if the, product develops, um, the patient develops a bleed or um, needs surgery, and this should help boost the sales of Prodaxa, which have been a little bit disappointing. It also gives Prodaxa an edge over its rival factor 10A in, in inhibitor anticoagulants like Eliquis and Xarelto. These don't yet have a reversal agent, although Portola Pharmaceuticals is developing a universal agent for all of these drugs, and that drug, that product's now waiting approval, which should come later this year. Finally, in the cardiovascular section, we've got Novartis's angiotensin receptor neprilitin inhibitor which became the first new agent for heart failure in 20 years. But again, despite strong data and a clear medical need, this product's also fallen victim to the payer's reluctance to actually part with money. And once again, its early sales have been disappointing. So it seems the theme developing is that pricing and reimbursement struggles that are common in Europe have definitely crossed the Atlantic. So we're going to move on to the best of the rest now. We have in respiratory, GSK launched Nucala, which is uh, for severe eosinophilic asthma. And this product is an interleukin-5 antagonist. Luckily, it got a broader um, label than was recommended by its advisory panel, which is going to stand it in good stead for um, competitors coming up. Now, the severe eosinophilic asthma population, it only affects 3% of asthmatics in the US, but actually accounts for half of all the direct healthcare costs for the disease. In severe disease, these white blood cells, they accumulate in the lungs, and the process is mediated by IL-5. The next two products we can see are um, Alexion's two enzyme replacement therapies. These, both of these are for rare indications. We've got Strensic for pediatric hyperphosphatasia and Canuma for lysosomal acid lipase deficiency. Again, um, just repeating again that these sales of both of these products have got off to a slow start. And finally, we have the long-awaited launch of flibanserin for female sexual desire disorder by Sprout, which was then quickly sold to Valiant afterwards. So Sprout may have succeeded where Boehringer Ingelheim failed and got the product actually to the market, but it still has the side effect limitations and lack of marketing. And again, it's not been um, a success, the new female Viagra that some had hoped. So overall, I think we can see a pattern that novelty and orphan status are no guarantee of healthy sales, at least in the short term after, after launch. And now I'm going to hand back to Ian, who's going to dissect the pipeline. Thanks, Alex. So yes, yeah, so moving away from the success stories of last year, so good to see it was a good year, so that uh, justifies the expansion in the pipeline. But where is this expansion exactly taking place? We're going to dissect the pipeline in a number of different ways now. First by development stage or phase, then we'll be looking at the top companies by pipeline size, and then we'll be looking at the therapy areas, and finally mechanisms of action and target. So here we've broken down those 13,700 odd drugs uh, into the, the most advanced stage of development which they're currently in. Uh, so you can see the gold bars represent the 2016 figure and the purple blue bar the 2015 figure. So I think the first thing that's, that's easy to spot is really there were increases at, really across all of the different phases. The largest increase uh, was at the preclinical stage, which is what you would expect both from increased and better de detection by our editors and analysts 
and also that's probably where the effect of the editorial changes which I mentioned earlier on are most felt so that's not really surprising but I think where it's really interesting to look at is is the clinical stages so let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail so on this graph we're looking back a little bit further into the past so looking at the numbers of drugs at each clinical stage right the way from 2007 towards the left of each set of bars up to 2016 towards the right so what you can see here is again there have been increases really pretty much every year across all phases but there are variations in that uh, so from 2015 to 2016 we saw an additional 190 drugs in phase one an increase of 11.4 percent an increase of 110 drugs in phase two that was only at 5.1 percent so the rate slowed there but the really interesting and I think encouraging thing is if you look at the phase three figure, this increase by 146 actually represents an 18.1 percent increase in the number of drugs at phase three, which obviously is the most advanced stage. So these are the drugs which are closest to market. And also, if you look back to those, uh, the earliest bars on that graph, you'll see you know, expansion was pretty moribund in the, in the mid, uh, mid noughties and late noughties. So the fact that the, the figures in the last few years have really started to increase is again another really encouraging sign. Let's look at the pipeline by the top companies here then. So this is the top 10 and uh, they're arranged by the number of drugs which they're reporting in their pipeline as of 2016. You can see there's not been much change in the personnel in the top 10 and not, not at the top either. So GlaxoSmithKline just hangs on to its crown with the, the most number of drugs in, in the pipeline at 242 slightly down from 258 in the previous year and the the column on the right hand side tells you how many of these drugs were actually originated by each company as opposed to them being licensed in so glaxo smith klein originated 144 of the 242 drugs in its pipeline novartis stays at number two uh, only just uh, nearly nearly beat glaxo smith klein and it had a slightly smaller decrease so there's obviously a bit of jockeying for position going on there AstraZeneca uh, and Johnson & Johnson and Merck & Co all shuffled up at the expense of Roche, which, which had a bit of a fall. Now at this point, until today, I was going to talk about the fact that uh, when, when Pfizer and Allergan complete their merger, they would zoom massively to the top of this chart and they, in fact would have had 336 drugs, putting them way ahead of anybody else. Obviously there would have been some consolidation following. But uh, of course, as I'm sure most people have woken up to find out today, the merger is off today. So, Alex, this is obviously a breaking news story for Script. So I wonder if you could comment on that from a journalist perspective. Well, yeah, well, it's clearly quite embarrassing for him. You know, he and Brent Saunders have been spending the last few months on a roadshow trying to reassure both employees and investors that the deal was sound and it would be going ahead. And don't forget, this is the second failed mega deal for Ian Reid in the space of two years. So it's not looking great for him. But what will be interesting is to see what Pfizer's next move is going to be. It's likely that it's going to break it into separate growth and legacy business because this was the plan that was, was put on hold while the Allegandia was, was underway. And analysts are actually already lining up some potential new targets for Pfizer, including AbbVie, Biogen and Regeneron. AbbVie obviously called off its um, potential merger with Shire um, a couple of years ago after a previous tightening of the tax inversion rules in the US so that could be one um, not sure whether there'll be any fallout for the Shire back Salter deal because here tax inversion was slightly less of uh, a driver for the deal rather than the, the, their desire to make the world's biggest rare disease company but yes it's um, interesting times indeed indeed so let's look at the the next 15 if you like so away from the top 10 to the rest of the top 25 and here, um, one thing that's interesting to note is that if the Shire and Baxalta does indeed go ahead, as we're suggesting it should still, this would uh, put it around, around, around just outside the top 20, with around 78 drugs. So again, not much change in personnel here. Celgene and Gilead Sciences being, being the only two entrants into the top 25. I think Gilead is clearly the more interesting of the two in terms of the fact that it did so well in the last few years with its hepatitis C breakthrough drugs it's obviously investing this some of this money back into its pipeline because its pipelines now uh, get getting to the size of the rest of the, the big boys if you like what about the total number of companies involved in R&D so this graph here shows you the total number of companies that have a drug in development as of the start of each year 
And you can see again an increase. In fact, it's uh, 3,687 3, uh, companies with drugs um, at, the, at the start of this year, up from 3,286. Um, this is an increase of 401 companies and I think an increase of 12.2%. So the number of companies is actually outpacing the rise in the number of drugs. Uh, bizarrely, there are exactly the same number of companies added to the Foreign Projects database during 2015 as, as there were the previous year, 618. So the fact that the increase has gone up slightly, again, indicates that fewer companies have been moving out of R&D. Um, one thing that's really interesting to look at is that the fact that of these 3,687 companies, there's a whopping 2,084 which just have one or two drugs in development. So these are either the really uh, small startups or the, the real niche companies. Uh, and, and that's a huge amount of the, of the, of the R&D landscape that's accounted for by these emerging companies. And clearly, a lot of these companies are never going to be able to bring a drug to market by themselves. So they're either probably going to license out their drugs to one of the big boys, or they may indeed be acquired, which is what we're seeing increasingly. Um, and this, this uh, percentage of the, the small companies, again, is increasing. And interestingly, it goes up by about 0.5% this year, which is exactly the same as the amount of the top 25 uh, shrunk by. So the top 25 companies account for 0.5% uh, smaller slice of the pie than they did this time last year. So it shows a slight sort of change in, in the R&D landscape away from Big Pharma. And uh, we're seeing this increasing number of small startup companies, which really, to a certain expect, extent, reflects uh, the fact there's been a lot of venture capital finance out there in previous years. So where is all this work taking place? And one thing that's in, good to look at is to, to split the R&D landscape by where countries are headquartered. Um, not surprisingly, the US um, is still the biggest, uh, accounting for almost half of all companies. What's really interesting in this uh, pie chart is China. So China, as we know, um, has had a big generics industry for a year, lots of copy products, but really only in the last few years has it really entered the, the novel pharmaceutical R&D arena. Uh, last year, it was the third biggest country in Asia by this measure, and this year we expected it to overtake South Korea to go to number two. But in fact, it also overtook Japan to go to number one. So in terms of the number of individual companies, not necessarily the number of drugs, but the number of companies headquartered in uh, Asia, China is now the biggest. Let's move now to split the pipeline down by different therapeutic areas. So the broad therapy areas for which drugs are, are in development. And it's worth noting here that a single drug can be counted in more than one of these bars if it has indeed uh, more than one activity. So it could be an anti-cancer drug, which also has a dermatological indication, for instance. So again, you can see that the, uh, the, the, the therapeutic areas, there's been increases across the board. What's really interesting to note is how far cancer is uh, um, ahead of some of the small areas at the top. 4,176 drugs uh, have a cancer indication. So again, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. That's actually 30.4% of the pipeline drugs. So that means almost a third of all drugs in development have at least one cancer disease as, as one of their targets, which yeah, it's, it's really an extraordinary dominance by cancer, which, again, if we look back on the data going back the last 25 years or so, which we, we have been doing, uh, we've just seen it get bigger and bigger and bigger every year. So it used to be about 15%, and now it's, as I say, approaching a third. The growth rate last year hit 16% compared to the 11.5% that we saw across the board. Um, and although there were growth across all of the different therapeutic areas, there are a number which underperformed. Cardiovasculars only increased by 4.6%. Neurologicals, which have had a very disappointing uh, few years in terms of delivering new drugs, and have a number of diseases which are proving very difficult to, to crack, such as Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that, that only increased by 7.7%, even though it's the, the second largest therapeutic area. And anti-infectives only increased by 6.2%, despite the fact that this is an area where there's a an increasing need for new drugs uh, to come onto the market due to the emergence of a, a multi-drug resistant bacteria and viruses. Uh, there were two areas which out, outperformed the, uh, the, the increase, the average increase, though, and they were immunologicals up by 11.8% and sensory up by 13.5%. 
We can now zoom in a little bit, little bit more. So rather than looking at the broad therapeutic areas, we can look at the individual diseases which drugs are currently in development for. And we have a classification here which covers nearly 1,500 different individual diseases. What you're looking at here is just the top 10. So the first thing to notice is that seven of the top 10 diseases are, are cancer diseases. So breast cancer um, at the top, the most common disease for drugs to be developed against. Uh, 614 drugs in the pipeline, up from 552 last year, pretty significant increase. An even bigger increase seen by non-small cell lung cancer, which goes up to number two at 452. Colorectal cancer is at number three. And then a big increase up the charts for pancreatic cancer, a very difficult to treat and, and troubling disease. So it's good to see more drugs in development for that indication. Um, so what about uh, the split of these drugs between small molecules and biologicals? So I think 20 years ago, which is when the graph on this uh, uh, slide starts from, everyone imagined that biologicals and the new technologies that were coming through, some of which emerging from the Human Genome Project, but also the new monoclonal technology and recombinants, they were going to ride to the rescue and small molecule research was almost going to be kind of eclipsed and obsolete. And what you can see here, where we're splitting the pipeline up by percentage, um, is this, this hasn't really happened. Um, over the past year, uh, there was an 11.3% increase in small molecule drugs and a 15.7% increase in monoclonals. Um, so gradually, we're seeing biologicals take a larger slice of the pie, but it's really only gone up from 15% to about 30% over the course of 20 years, which is not exactly revolutionary. Um, Biotech is, is accounting for about a third now, and I think the thing to note on this graph is that there was a bit of a an uptick from 2015 to 2016 after a few years where it's been very, very gradual. So be interested to come back next year and see whether this has been sustained. Um, uh, one area of increase you can't see from this graph, which is particularly interesting, is cellular therapies, which had an enormous 47.2% 40, increase over the past year. So that's, that's really a, a new coming technology, which is exciting, a lot of interest. So let's take another look a uh, little bit more detail in the actual individual mechanisms of action and targets for which drugs are being developed against. Now, the way the um, uh, mechanism of action pharmacology classification uh, is structured on farm projects is it's hierarchical. So what this means is there are a number of broad categories at the top of the hierarchy and more specific ones as you go down the hierarchy. So it's probably not surprising in the top 10 we see a number of really broad uh, mechanisms of action. What tends to happen is that uh, when drugs first come onto the database, and you'll have noticed earlier on that around half of the drugs in the active set are still at preclinical, there's not much information around, or in some cases their precise mechanism may not even be, have been ascertained. So this is what skews the data to give the, the more broad mechanisms of action the larger numbers. So the really, really broad, non-specific term immunostimulant hangs on to the number one slot. What's interesting this year is about a year ago, in January 2015, we uh, created a new uh, broad um, category for uh, anti-cancer immunotherapy. So this is the immuno-oncology drugs that everyone's getting really excited about. Um, it accounts for about 40 different individual mechanisms of action, such as PD-1 inhibition, TIM-3 inhibition, and a number of different CD antigen subtype antagonists. Um, but within, in its first year, in its debut year, it's already, in fact, now, now past 400, a number of drugs in development. So this is the area that everyone's getting really excited about. There are a couple of drugs on, on the market already, um, but there's certainly a huge amount of, uh, of interest in this area. So we'll see how this pans out as things uh, develop. Look at, looking at individual targets now, so these are the individual proteins that drugs are actually targeting. So these are proteins coded by, by genes according to the uh, NCBI database. I think what's interesting here is actually at number one here, there isn't a cancer target. It's the mu1 opioid receptor. This is, this is a pain target. So you'll notice there are, there are actually only three cancer targets in the top 10, a tumor necrosis factor, a B2, epidermal growth factor receptor, and, um, and actually also the VEGF, the TNF is not always a cancer one. Um, so this really kind of gives you a flavor of the fact that there's actually a diverse range of targets available uh, for cancer. A lot of 
science has been worked out for cancer in the last few years. So there is a broad range of different targets. This is why fewer cancer targets are, are showing up in the top 10. To give you some more information on mechanisms and targets, so anti-cancer immunotherapies I mentioned, a new class taking R&D by storm. Uh, only four of the top 10 targets are against cancer, indicating target di diversity in cancer. Um, in, we have uh, now 1,518 individual proteins being targeted by drugs. Um, the vast majority of drugs are targeting a protein of some kind, whether it be an enzyme, a receptor, or, or another biological mechanism. Uh, some drugs don't, don't target proteins, but the last, vast majority do. So given that some estimates reckon there's around 50,000 potential druggable proteins in the human body, this would indicate that really we've only scratched the surface of drug R&D so far, which is obviously encouraging. It means there's a lot of work for everyone still to do, keep us all in jobs, I hope. Um, and uh, the other interesting thing to note is how much this figure has gone up in the past year. It's gone up by 113 new targets, which were identified for the first time in 2015. And this is up from 77 identified in the previous year. So this is a good proxy for the, what we like to call the innovation index in the industry. We like to see a lot of new targets coming into R&D every year. And that's, it's been very up and down, actually, in previous years. But so good to see, again, that 2015 was a good year by this metric. Another thing that's interesting to look at, which Alex alluded to earlier on, is the strategies which companies are using to get their drugs onto the market or to get the most uh, biggest return from them. What you can see here is the, the blue test tubes indicating the number of drugs which received orphan drug status during each calendar year, and the gold test tubes showing you the number of drugs which were granted one of the different expedited review statuses which are available to get drugs onto the market more quickly. I should point out the 2013 figures are not complete here as we only started recording this figure halfway through 2013. But I think the, the thing to, to notice straight away is there's a big increase in the orphan, number of orphan drug status is being granted and also in the use of expedited review status. Now the FDA reported actually there were fewer drugs using expedited review status in 2015. So this would indicate this is really a growth area outside of the US, particularly in the EU. So that really concludes our uh, look at the pipeline for, for 2016. What to, look, what to look out for in the remainder of the year? Well, we've certainly seen another record rise in pipeline size, which included an, an increase across all phases and therapeutic areas, and cancer strengthening its lead. So can, can these trends continue is the big question. Can the pipeline continue to go up by ever increasingly larger percentages year on year when the number of new active substances is sort of possibly going up a little bit, but not hugely. And really, can, can we put, be putting all our eggs in the cancer basket, if you like, increasingly, which is what's happening? Will these trends continue? We'll have to come back next year to find out. But before we leave, uh, let's take a look at the, the, the outlook for new active substances in 2016. And for that, I'm going to hand back to Alex. Thanks, Ian. So this is just a quick recap of what we've said. The number of new active substance notches dropped last year, but the level what was seen was in keeping with other previous years apart from 2014 stellar anomaly. Also, um, orphans and oncology NASs are increasing too. Um, what else we've seen is that the big problem of reimbursement um, is coming, it's rearing its head in the US now, not just in Europe, and this is definitely a trend that we should expect to see continue. Um, what else, um, looking forward to 2016, um, overall it does from a first glance, looked like it might be rather less exciting than um, 2015 in terms of novelty, at least. And I'm going to take a closer look at that now. So the, looking at the NAS launches that could be expected this year, going by the PDUFA dates of uh, major drugs that are due to be approved this year, and the early signs are that um, it's not been good. It's not been a great start to the year at all. Um, so far, there have been disappointments with several key novel products, and most notably for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which, as you know, is a rare genetic disorder. And there are several drugs trying to target that now, and all three of them are experiencing setbacks. Um, most notably, we have Biomarin's Kindreiser, which was um, rejected by the FDA in January. It previously had a really rough ride at its panel meeting in November. And meanwhile, Sarepta Zetaplersen has had its Purdue for date pushed back by a few months. 
The other potential treatment is translana from PTC Therapeutics, and this got hit with a refusal to file letter, which added to the general gloom surrounding this area. So it seems that the prizes are still there to be won in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Another thing adding to the gloom was that CTI and Bexalta have had to withdraw their NDA for their potential myelofibrosis treatment for critinib. This was when um, what happened was that more deaths were seen in patients in the phase 3 study who were receiving the JAK2 FTL3 inhibitor than were seen in the um, control arm, which led to the study being put on hold and then being dropped. Um, and yes, yeah, so basically they've gone back to the drawing board with that one. More cheerfully, however, we have had a few approvals this year. We've had Lily's TOTS and Tevis Sancaire, which have been approved um, this year already. But um, what's notable about these is that both Me2 products. TOTS is an IL-17A inhibitor, and that's going to have to compete in psoriasis and other inflammatory conditions with Novartis' Cosentix, which has had a very promising start. And Teva's anti-IL-5 product, Sancare, this is the one that's going to be chasing GSK's Nucala for the severe asthma indication that I was talking about earlier. And the problem is with, for Teva is that um, this product's been approved, but it's got a narrower label than um, the GSK product and is only able to be used in patients over 18 rather than adolescents as well. So not only is it second to the market, but it's also got a narrower label. But there are some other products whose Purdue for dates are due later this year, and hopefully, fingers crossed, all being well, they will come to market. We've got AbbVie and Roche's Breakthrough Therapy Venetoclax. This is for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And this has been filed on the basis of um, promising phase two data in a subset of CLL patients who have a 17p deletion. But what's the problem that this drug will, is going to face is that it's, it's going to have to muscle its way onto a, a market that's getting increasingly crowded in CLL. Arcadia's new Plazid, this is a bit more promising. This is a, um, a selective inverse agonist of the thyroid HT2A receptor. And this looks like it's on its way to approval because it had a really promising FDA panel last week in psychosis associated with Parkinson's disease. Now, this is uh, an indication for which there are at present no approved US um, therapies in the US. So this, um, this is a nice area opening up for Arcadia. Luckily um, for it, a decision is due by the end of the month, so um, all being well, that should be slightly smoother than some other products that we've had before. As I mentioned before, also we've got Portola's and Exonet Alpha. This is the anticoagulation reversal agent that I talked, and this is the one that is going to work with the factor 10A inhibitors, the Aniquises and Xarelto's. Um, Portola's due to hear the fate of this in August, um, so has had you know a good head start on that but it's it's definitely catching up and finally we're going to look at Sanofi and Regeneron and they are hoping to hear about their rheumatoid arthritis product Cerulumab later in this year this is an anti-IL-6 receptor inhibitor but again it's going to have to go up into a crowded market it's going to go straight ahead head to head with Roche's Actemra and also, it's going to have competition from other anti-IL-6 agent that's in development, and that's Johnson & Johnson and GSK Sirucumab. And also, complicating the whole field further is the fact that there are new um, biosimilar versions of the anti-TNF therapies that have come to market, which is um, changing the whole face of that um, therapeutic area. But, um, yeah, Stoffy and Regeneron should hope to hear by um, from the FDA in um, October. So um, I think overall it definitely does look like it's slight, you know, it's not as novel, it's not as an exciting year so far, but um, it is early days, so we'll see what happens. Thanks, Alex. So that brings us to the end of our review of Pharma R&D today. Thank you very much for joining us. If you have any further questions or comments, please email them to pharma at informa.com and we'll be certain to get back to you. So thank you all again, and have a great rest of the day. We look forward to talking to you again this time next year. Bye-bye. Thank you.